Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and we're continuing our lecture series on machine learning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a, kind of a break. We've been um, just plowing through inferential and predictive methods, and I think it's time to kind of sit back and take stock and dive in and have a bit of a deep dive into tuning hyperparameters. Let's talk about training and testing a little bit more detail. The talk about model goodness metrics that we'll use in tuning the hyperparameters and talk about general cross validation workflows end up with a little bit of philosophy at the very end. What's the motivation? Why do we want to do this right now? Well, we need to formalize some concepts. We've been kind of dancing around saying things like cross validation, jackknife, K fold and so forth, talking about model goodness, and we haven't really defined it, and it's time. It's time to get into this so that we can move forward with a bit of, a bit more foundation. Let's talk about training and testing overall. Just a quick reminder, we've covered this a couple times. I don't wanna to spend too much time, but make sure we're all on the same page. Model parameters, they're, we're going to go ahead and train them or set them, fit them, during the training phase of our model construction. We'll take the training data and we're gonna fit the associated parameters in the model, such as this polynomial with the B3, B2, B1, and constant term. We'll go ahead and fit them so that we maximize the accuracy with regard to the training data. Hyperparameters are different than parameters. They are the parts of the model that usually constrain the complexity of the model. So they would, for in the example of a polynomial model, we would be talking about the hyperparameter being the selection of the order, seventh order down here, fifth order, third order, and first order behind me there. So that choice is going to be the hyperparameter. And in general, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a training and testing workflow, establish subsets of the data for training and testing, separate it out, We'll go ahead and train the model parameters to maximize accuracy with the training data, which will result in a suite of models with different hyperparameters and level of complexity. And then we'll pick the model that maximizes the accuracy with the testing data. This is how we're effectively tuning the hyperparameters. Okay, so what do we have when we're hyperparameter tuning? What do we really end up with? And what we have is a suite of models of variable level of complexity. And there may be some other decisions that are informed by a range of hyperparameters, but in general, it's gonna be complexity that we'll be dialing. And so we will also have a set of testing data that we withheld from the training, no peaking. We didn't use that to build the, to set the parameters in the model, they were withheld. And so in this example, the X's are the training data and the circles, the red circles are the testing data, and we have a range of models here going from first order, third order, fifth order, and seventh order polynomial. And these are the models that we're gonna be working with for the purpose of hyperparameter tuning, and this is the data that we have to work with. Now we've done a training and test split before we started building the models, and we had to make a choice about how to split. And as I mentioned before, you gotta make sure that's a fair split. For example, if we were trying to go ahead and build a model to make predictions of well logs, and we were going ahead and training and testing with this suite of well logs right here, if we did random selection of a small proportion of the well logs, then you would imagine, see these very thin gray lines, we'd, we'd remove those samples. Now, I tried to draw random, I hope it looks random. And what we'll see in general is that it, none of those estimation or prediction problems would be very hard at all. Most of the time we're making a prediction where we're sandwiched with lots of training data below and above ourselves in space along the well, along the depth coordinate. And we're making predictions usually with offsets from training data of maybe half a foot, which is not a very hard prediction problem. Now, where do we want to use the model? Do we want to use the model to make predictions at greater distances over larger subsets. This might be too hard over here. If we were to train and test like this, we may have actually, if you look at the well logs, there's a different behavior in this part of the well log. If we took the whole thing out and made 
to test after we trained with a distinctly different part. Maybe the estimation problem is too hard. So we're balancing prediction difficulty to try to match where we're actually going to use the model. It's supposed to be a dress rehearsal of the model actually being used. So we wanted to make it similar in difficulty to real world application of the model. Now, how much data should be used in testing? A lot of students have been asking this in the class. If you go across various publications, you look at various authors who have run, sometimes using truth data sets, very exhaustive data sets where they've drawn out reasonable samples to work with. And if you know the truth, you can actually establish what was the optimum workflow. In general, you'll see authors report 30 to 15% of the total data set withheld for testing. Now, there's a balancing act here we should be cognizant of, and that is data withheld for testing reduces data available for training. Therefore, it really does reduce the accuracy of our model. Now, data withheld for testing does improve the accuracy of your assessment of model performance. If you don't have enough testing data, you don't really know how your model is performing. A balancing act, better model or better ability to assess the model. Kind of cool, right? I, I think it's cool. Now, various authors have experimented on a variety of testing training ratios and have recommended splits. And I mentioned the numbers up above 30 to 15 percent is what I typically saw. The optimum ratio of training and testing split really will depend on the problem setting. And in fact, one really cool way to think about it is you could consider the difficulty in training. How many parameters are you trying to fit with the model and how much variation do you see in the data? That, that would be very cool. And then the difficulty in the difficulty in testing. In other words, how many hyperparameters do you have to fit? with the model and what's the sensitivity of those hyperparameters and the response of the model goodness so this would this would be a nice way to, to think about it now one thing i should mention and some of the students in my class have brought this up isn't there a more complete workflow training validation and then testing there, there, yeah there is a more complete work workflow that is commonly applied now to avoid confusion in this class we will continue with the simplified train test convention only now how does the training validation testing work you train with the training data sounds axiomatic i know but the model sees and learns from this data then you validate with the validation data now it should provide you with an unbiased evaluation of the model fit to tune the hyperparameters. And then we'll go ahead and test with the testing data. Now this data is withheld until the model is solidified. The model is complete. It's a final evaluation of the model. Now you'll see this very commonly applied when people are trying to compare completely different models with each other. It's like the a grand challenge of you know, which model outperforms which, and you withhold this data very carefully. So here's a schematic or a visualization of what this might look like. Train, validation, and test is held really separately because it's not seen at all until the model is concrete. Can't use it at all to change the model. All right, I'm gonna stop there. I'll record a separate lecture video which will get into model goodness metrics and then another video that will dive into discussion around cross-validation methodologies, workflows, and some philosophy. Now, I'll leave it there. So I am Michael Perch, an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. It is my pleasure to share every single lecture that I teach within my university classes with anyone in the public. Anyone in the professional, um, in the workplace, any, anybody wants to learn about these concepts. I really love that. I hear a lot of great feedback from folks who use this content. All of the examples that I ever demonstrate are available on GitHub too. And um, I hope it's useful to you. All right, everyone, take care. Goodbye.